way, Brian, who um, uh, uh, accepted my talk, and we even like had a miscommunication. I was supposed to do it another time, and he said, "No, come back." And your passion and your inspiration really like perked me up today. I was a little bit, a little bit down. So thank you. Um, my name is Benjamin Sugar. I'm from Civic Lab, and tonight I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, civic making and uh, and and a project as an example of that that uses Python. So um, Civic Lab is we're kind of trying to form ourselves into sort of a civic a civic civic maker space. Um, we are in the bottom floor of this um, firehouse um, at 114 North Aberdeen in the West Loop. Um, we have kind of four core things we do. Number one, uh, we have co-working. Uh, we have floating desks, which are $100 a month. We also have fixed desks, which are $200 a month. We teach classes. Um, so this is last night. There was a DIY hydroponics class. Um, it was pretty awesome. Yeah. Yes, it wasn't what you thought. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, we also have meetings. Uh, so tonight, as we speak, a group called Restore the Fourth is meeting. Uh, this is a picture from their poster party. Uh, they're working to uh, repeal Section 215 of the Patriot Act, which is what allows the NSA to do what the NSA does. Uh, this is from their actual protest, and I guess this is a, a meme place, isn't it? Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. It just says, uh, it's from Office Space. Uh, yeah, if you could stop spying on us, that would be great. So, um, I, and I love Futurama too, that's a good one as well. So, we also do outreach. Um, this is something I did with the Garfield Park Garden Network. I used a uh, citizen science kit called uh, Balloon Mapping, which is from a great group called The Public Lab. Um, and it was an epic fail. Uh, that's us. <laughs> everything, everything came out blurry. There's nothing like disappointing children. It was great. But, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so Civic Lab. So, what is civic making? What stuff do you make? Um, and w where we're under, we're in, under an umbrella called civic media. So civic media, what? Um, what is that? Well, not as many Futurama folks as I would have expected in this crowd, but that's okay, that's all right. Um, it was actually described to me really clearly. The other night we had the Chicago Women's Developers Group over, and somebody from that group said it to me completely clearly. Um, and she said, civic media is uh, thing, media that nudges people to care about stuff in their community and or empower people who care about stuff to translate that caring into actions. And this is the part where you can tell she's a developer, where community and stuff and actions are totally variable. So, um, so here's an example of that. This is the first project. This is a project I currently work on, and this was my entree into uh, civic media. It's a project called Between the Bars. Um, Between the Bars is a paper-based blogging platform for people who are incarcerated. To put it simply, People who are incarcerated send us blog posts in the mail on paper. We scan those blog posts, we put them online. When they get a comment, we mail the comment back. And that comment has a, an ID on it. We don't call it a code because prisons don't like that. Uh, it's an ID and they can use that ID on their response. And using that idea, we can um, match their comment with the other comments. So we can thread the comments just like any other blog. Um, I'm part of the team. We also have Charlie Dittar, um, who is just an awesome developer. He's the one who um, conceived of the idea, with, along with another guy, uh, Benjamin Mako Hill. Um, and Charlie is the lead and only developer of the site. We also have Carl McLaren, who is our other friend and colleague um, who works with us. So why do this? Um, so first of all, 1% um, of the adult population in this country is incarcerated. Uh, America, we like to be big and number one, so good for us. We have more prisoners in both per capita and absolute numbers than any other country in the world. Yes, Amer USA, yes. 7% um, of Americans are under some form of correctional supervision. So that means parole, jail, uh, you name it. That's, that's, I mean, that's nearly 10%. That's enormous. Um, it disproportionately affects poor and minorities. One in three black men will be incarcerated in their lifetime. There's a loss of income and job training while you're in prison, and because uh, of uh, certain initiatives that you have to declare that you are, uh, had formerly been incarcerated, uh, you, it's very difficult to get a job. And there's reduced civic participation. Uh, you can't vote, and you have very limited access to the social safety net. Um, the root causes of incarceration are very complex, but um, for us, we really see them as, number one, attitudes towards, in towards punishment. People in America, um, we have sort of a vindictive strain, I think, in this country. We're not, in, we say we're interested in rehabilitation, whatever that word may mean, but really what we're interested in is the punishment part. Um, we also have 
really bad sentencing policies. Um, Aaron Schwartz is somebody who um, encountered that. We have really ridiculous things, three strikes laws, um, differences between crack and powder, uh, uh, crack cocaine. Um, we also have perverse economic incentives. There are private corporations, and those private corporations, they, whether they uh, outright say it or not, they are incentivized, we're incentivized to have more people be incarcerated because that's their business. Um, it's really hard. There's a lack of po political will to change. Uh, uh, people who are politicians, they appear soft on crime. And it's also outside of the popular discourse. It's not something we normally talk about. So our intervention into that is to end the silence about mass incarceration. So we can't change what we're doing. What we're doing is not working. We can't change what we're doing unless we talk about that thing. And in order to talk about that thing, we have to engage in a dialogue with everybody who is affected by that thing, including the people who are incarcerated themselves. So that includes the incarcerated, includes families, includes victim of crime, and average citizens. It's got to be a whole group thing. The problem is that prisoners, uh, prisons are structured against dialogue. They rarely attract media coverage. Politicians don't want to appear soft on crime. Visitation is very expensive. Sometimes you are incarcerated miles and hundreds of miles away from where you live. Phone systems are operated by monopolies. This is changing, but um, basically it, in some places it can cost you $20 for a 15 minute phone call. And that's because the phone company gives a kickback to the prison um, and the way they, they do the kickback is they just make it higher. They don't like reduce their uh, profit margin or whatever some businessy term is. They just make the cost higher. Um, so given these constraints, the US mail in this internet age it remains the most accessible, but it's alienating to people because people don't write letters anymore. I actually have letters that I need to send. I guess this will be on TV now, good. I have to send to some people in the program, and like even me, it's just like, oh my God, to mail these things. So what a melodrama. So enter between the bars. Um, here's just some quick stats. Um, it's kind of, to me, it's a little joke. Sometimes people talk like there's only like three guys running Twitter, you know, because these days we can really scale stuff up. There's only three of us. This is kind of how many things we manage. Uh, we really only have probably about 250 active bloggers, but um, 7,000 letters that we've received, 7,500 blog posts, 5,200 comments, and that's just in two years, and that's with that much time and attention. We could not do that possibly without help from uh, software. Why are we doing that? Uh, number one, we want to strengthen strong ties. Those are ties that your family, close friends have. Again, because it's so difficult to communicate with people in prison, those ties, those family bonds, they break down. We also want to create new weak ties. Weak ties are paths to resources. That's how you get jobs, friends of a friend of a friend. Um, we also want to engage in, uh, promote a citizen identity over criminal identities. There's been research that shows that when you have a citizen identity, you're less likely to reoffend. Um, we also want to promote uh, dialogue. Dialogics is this idea that we create and recreate ourselves in a dialogue with others, and that that dialogue reveals a certain truth. Um, we also want to end depersonalization, of, uh, which is kind of a, a take from the panopticon. Um, and uh, basically, when you don't know who the person is who is watching you, um, that the watcher can depersonalize the people who are being watched, and that's us. No, I mean, they're the people being depersonalized. We're the watchers who are depersonalizing. Um, and also demystifying, because we don't, I mean, all we really see is like lock up on MSNBC. So it's this big, you know, what goes on in there? Um, yes, and the other thing is to provide, this is something from the disabilities movement, to allow them to have, a, to people who are incarcerated to have a voice. So. It's in their words, on their own terms. We're not trying to speak for other people. We're letting those people try to speak for themselves. So what type of stuff do we receive? We receive artwork. We rece this is ink on cloth. Um, we receive interviews, poetry, um, daily journals, comics, you name it. What conversations take place? And try to keep in mind that list of things I said we were trying to do. So this, this goes to strong ties. Um, and also families. Having public diet conversation with families uh, destigmatizes families, uh, is destigmatizing for families who have people who are incarcerated. So um, this is from a guy, uh, Joe Galliard. Um, he writes, he talks, uh, I was married for 26 years to a wonderful woman. I have two daughters, Faith and Joe, and they're both extremely beautiful, etc. Um, and then the daughters write in, my one complaint is that I've been grossly underrepresented in this blog. I look for future entries to be so, uh, devoted solely to my wonderfulness. And the other sister writes, well, I'm not as selfish as my sister to request entries devoted solely to my wonderfulness. After all, why say what is already known? You might have been the, f you might have been the first sis, but they got it right on the second try. So um, we've got this going on. We also have elucidation because prison's a mystery. 
So uh, it doesn't occur to many of us who have never been in prison that it can be so different state by state. What makes one go to a Florida prison versus a prison in another state? Location of crime, court tried, question mark? Uh, Eric Wilkes right back. When you mentioned your desire for information, I knew your first question would be why the difference, so I took it upon myself to do some homework. Since I've been down here for 10 years and have only been in Florida prisons, I had to ask guys from other states and others who have been in the state for 30 years or some more questions. So through this little keyhole in the wall, you've got one guy and he can talk to a bunch of other guys and he can send that information through the mail out to you, the public. Um, and we also have um, identity, identity as a citizen. Um, there was a, one writer we have, uh, William David Lindley. He was a... Um, uh, he was in the Marines, I can't remember his rank, but he was ranked enough that he had other guys in his platoon. And so all of his guys found him. And uh, I'll just go through one. He says, not sure if you remember me, but I served with you back in the early 80s and the 90s. A lot of young Marines looked up to you in the day. I was one of them. I just want you to know uh, uh, I still feel the same way. And this goes on, like eight of them came. Um, and he writes, um, it's nice to see this blog is working. Even though more than 20 years have passed since we served together, you found me. Perhaps people will, who underestimated the Marines are such fine examples of the American spirit. Through good times and bad uh, victories and disaster, our brotherhood is one, born from shared hardship, adversity, and triumph. So he gets to uh, keep this other identity, this other thing. It doesn't, hopefully, this will help him not to uh, help the world to not label him and consume him under just this one incarcerated identity. So you're all probably thinking to yourself by now, but where's the pie? So, yes. Um, so um, the back end is Django, the database is Postgres, and the front end is Backbone. Um, so I said to Charlie, I said, because uh, he's the developer, um, I said, and you know, I know, I know some programming, but you know, this is way outside my layer. I said, Charlie, they're gonna wanna know, because Brian said, you, you gotta tell them about the Python. I said, Charlie, they're gonna wanna know, you know what are the pros and cons? And this is such a Charlie answer. He goes, well, compared to what? So I, I said, uh, so he said, well, if, compared to no framework, and this is probably going to be a lot of preaching to the choir, but no framework, you get batteries included with Django. You get your object relational manager, you get your URL, temp, uh, URL router, uh, templates, testing framework, email generation, plugins, yay for plugins, south and celery and compilers and user registrations. We also have, as we were discussing earlier, there's a rich library ecosystem. Our work depends a lot on PyPDF. Um, the Python image uh, library, Selenium, Fabric, and Sphinx, um, compared to other frameworks. Again, I think this will really be stuff we all uh, agree upon. Um, it's the Pythonic eschewing of magic, um, in that it is explicit, that makes it potentially more verbose, um, but, and there's a lot of uh, boilerplate imports. So if you go to our code, you'll see there's you know, like a stack of from this, import that, from this, import that. Um, but there's no multi-layered magic, and the code is readable, and there are fewer security issues. <clears throat> YAML, YAML. So today we all remember where we were the day that the YAML, no. Okay, I do. It's like the first time I heard from people in ages and all of a sudden emails. Um, so overall, um, you have uh, integration, you have Django integration, the parts are a cohesive whole, they play nice together. You don't have to think about what parts you need and there's a good security culture. Um, there's also familiarity. You're not using different parts from a homebrew micro framework. Um, it's easy for developers to get up to speed. And there's also uh, canonical patterns. So you have places for routes, models, views, templates, et cetera. And you'll know uh, the libraries and you know where to find the functionality. And also, most importantly for us, since we consider ourselves to be a news organization, it has news abstractions because that's where Django was developed. Demo time! Just trying to move along. Just doing, you know, you got your half hour and these things. So, um, so this is the back end of the blog, and this is where all the scanning happens. Um, normally, this is just in our sandbox. Normally, this is filled with pages and pages of documents that we have to see. What I'm going to show you is just how we process um, a comment. Um, oh, I forgot who this person was, actually. Um, anyway, so we'll just do somebody. Um, so let's say this is, so first, whoops, that's, first we find the author. Um, there we go. We'll choose this guy. That's our blogger. Um, and this is a comment that we have. And you'll see I told you earlier about this uh, reply ID. So I'm just going to, all comments at BTB are posts. Um, so I'm just going to label that post. Um, you can't quite see it, but there's a lot of other things we have here. We can ignore documents. We can get profiles. A lot of people write us with requests. So basically what this does is normally what we'll have here is like 10 pages. And so what we want to be able to do is go, OK, the first three pages, this is post one. This is a request. This is a profile, and these two pages are post two. So we can, whoops, 
save, edit the documents. Um, let's see if there we go. Um, okay, so now we can see uh, we call all of our comments. We just say that they are comment responses. Other blog posts obviously have titles. Um, we can tag it just like any other blog post if we wanted to. And then we write the reply ID. Let's see, that is QG77, QG77. Now, uh, because I forgot who this was, it's warning me that the author that I'm using uh, does not match the comment where this is going. Uh, but that's fine for now. Um, so it automatically brings up the title of the post. Uh, that this comment was in response to, which incidentally is, this is the title of the post by Michael Winsett. And um, I also have um, PDF editing tools. Um, it, between the bars, we don't really want to show the magic behind, uh, is it a green curtain, whatever it is. So um, I can uh, crop out um, everything else that I don't want. I also have redaction features, such as white redaction. We also have uh, black redaction. That's when we want people to know we redacted something. Um, we're trying to be honest of it. I can uh, turn it. Um, I can turn it by one degree, etc. So then, and this okay, ready to publish? Oh, published. Ready to publish is because we have so we publish just a mass of stuff. When we say ready to publish, we trickle out the feed over time so that everything gets a chance to be on the front page for a while. But for you, we'll just publish it. Oh, we gotta have a teaser. You know, on blogs when uh, you get like a paragraph. And uh, it says, click here for more. Well, we still have that, even though it's paper. So we get a teaser. There we go. Now I can view it on the site. And this is the comment. And it says, thanks, and other meaningful things that achieve BTB's core principles. Um, and you can see that it is in response to this really well-articulated and thoughtful post um, above. So um, that is that. Um, let's go back to this. So that was that. And uh, I encourage you to go to betweenthebars.org, leave a comment. It takes maybe five minutes because you want to read something, find something you like, and just put something out there. And uh, we're going to mail it, and we'll send it back to that person. And I think you will find it a unique experience. If you want to contact me about either Civic Lab um, you can contact me at benjamin at civiclab.us. You can also contact me at benjamin at betweenthebars.org. Thank you guys so very much. Yeah, questions?